Yahweh, Yahweh, your people are being killed by the enemy. Yahweh, will you just sit back and let your people be destroyed? Please, save us from the hands of these enemies. Yahweh. What did we do to deserve this? Why does it feel like you chose to turn your back on us when we needed you the most? Haman? Plotting to have us all killed? Your people, the descendants of Abraham, the Egyptians say you destroyed them to free us, to destroy us. Others say, where is their God? We heard he fed them with manna from the heavens. But still, even as exiles, we face persecution. Mordecai refuses to eat and prays to you. Your people refuse to eat. Pray to you concerning, concerning what I must do. Maybe indeed I become queen for such a time like this. I shall appear before the king. I shall expose the wickedness of Haman. But I pray, I pray he acts for me before I make my move. Yet still, I know I must go. The fate of my people rests on my shoulders. If I perish, I perish. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I feel like I'm standing on a magic carpet. So don't be shocked if I fly away. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Femi Omotayo, and uh, welcome to NCH Flix. This morning, I'm going to preach from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. I, I love the the thing we just watched. But I'm going to, and that's the, uh, the traditional view, so I'm, I'm going to give us a bit of a different um, perspective this morning, amen? amen? My goal this morning is not to entertain you. All right. It is to challenge you, All right. amen? It is to inspire you. Amen. I'm going to give this disclaimer before every sermon I preach. This is not a TED talk. Don't your neighbor say this is not a TED talk? A TED talk. Amen. So when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap, turned to your neighbor and say burlap, burlap, and ashes. And he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted wept and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuch, eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap. Touch your neighbor, say clothing. clothing. But Mordecai refused it. Then Esther sent for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So he went, to, he went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. And Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. In verse 8, Mordecai gave Hatash, 
a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all the Jews. He asked him to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked him to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. Now look at what Esther said in verse 9. So in verse 10. Then Esther told him to go back. Touch him and say, go back. Go back and tell Mordecai, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called me, called for me to come for him to him for 30 days. So he gave Esther's message to Mordecai, and Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you are in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Amen. Amen. We all know that Esther's story didn't start here. She wasn't born a queen. She wasn't even born into any of the aristocratic families of Persia. She was just an orphan, the Bible says, adopted by her cousin, a, a man named Mordecai. Now, some Jewish historians say that Esther's father died while her mother was pregnant for her and that her mother died while giving birth to her. And so eventually she ends up in the house of uh, Mordecai, her cousin. Esther was literally a nobody. In, in fact, the only thing Esther had going for her was that she was fine. But she was not that fine. No, it's true. She was fine. When we read the story of Esther, we always think that this was Miss Universe. She actually wasn't. Her name, her Jewish name was Hadassah, right? And Hadassah comes from the word Hadass, which means myrtle. A myrtle is a kind of plant. But the myrtle is neither tall nor short. It's, a, it's an average plant. And it has... Uh, a, a sallow tint to it. A sallow means it has a greenish, yellowish shade to it. She had a very unhealthy complexion. She was fine, but she wasn't that fine. But one day, one day she was chosen to be the wife of King Xerxes, king of the most powerful nation in the world. Out of thousands of beautiful women, a woman who was fine but not that fine was chosen. It was a miracle. Only God could have done it. I know Esther was humble. Yeah, she, she had to, she, I mean, she had to humble herself and learn from a eunuch. So let's give her credit for being humble. The Bible says she pleased the eunuch and, and she won his favor because she did everything he said. Now, some of us don't like to we don't like being told what to do. We pride ourselves on being rebels. We will only listen to the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't the Holy Spirit that was telling her what to do. It was a eunuch. And we all know what a eunuch is, right? You don't know? I'm not going to tell you. Google it. <laughs> listen, my brothers and sisters. God gives favor. But sometimes favor is not spiritual. Sometimes favor is as simple as being humble, as being obedient, and as being diligent. The Bible says Esther humbled herself, and she won Haggai, the eunuch, over. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 3, pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings what? Honor. Amen. You know what some of us call self-confidence is actually pride? Seriously, let's talk a little bit about self-confidence. What is self-confidence? When you look at yourself, yeah, when you, when you have confidence in your abilities, in your talents, in your giftings, and you look to yourself for your deliverance. And your self-confidence is a virtue in our communities. 
We aspire to have self-confidence. In fact, we, we talk about people that don't have self-confidence as if there's something wrong with them. We, we, we pride ourselves on people who, who look at their strengths and look at their abilities and say, I'm a man. But look at what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in himself. No, whose confidence is in who? In him. They will be like a tree planted by waters that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when it comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Never fails to bear fruit. So what do you think about self-confidence now? If your confidence is in your strengths and your abilities, you are going to run up against a brick wall with God. The Bible says God resists the proud and he empowers the lowly. Those who look in the mirror and realize that by myself I can do nothing. Those are the people God stands up for. God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who look to him for help. God helps those who put their confidence in him. Let me tell you something about Esther. It was not her humility that got her to the top. It was God. And because of God, nothing else, not her beauty, not her humility, not her abilities, because of God, she became queen. But you know the problem? When, when we get to the top, we become very afraid of falling to the bottom. Esther became queen. The idea of going back to being the cousin of Mordecai, who was fine but not that fine. That was tough. That was very difficult. Many of us have risen from where we started from. And the reality is that we are afraid of going back to where we started from. We don't want to go back there. We have moved from the apartments to the mansions. Forward ever, backward never. I reject it in Jesus' name. <laughs> we, we have moved from barely having enough. Now we have an abundance. We're not even talking about 401k anymore. We're talking about investments. We're talking about properties. We're talking about stocks, assets. Every day I hear about, uh, what do you call that thing? You'll be sleeping and you'll be making money. What do you call it? There's a name for it. Uh, I'm sorry? Passive income. Let me tell you something. There's nothing like passive income. If, you th if somebody comes and tells you, give me money and I'll give you passive income. So many of us, unfortunately, are like that. Our lives have become consumed with maintaining our status. And we will not do anything, anything to jeopardize that position. We will not risk anything that might potentially take us back to the apartment. So that fear starts to guide our choices. It starts to determine our actions. The reason why we are afraid is because we have forgotten how we got to the top. You have forgotten how you got that job. You have forgotten that you were not qualified or that you lied on your resume. You have forgotten. You have forgotten that someone else did your interview for you. You have forgotten that the birth certificate you took to the embassy, you got it from Oluwole. You have forgotten that it was God. You have forgotten the line at the embassy. Now you are carrying your, your chest. You have forgotten. Let me tell you something. Pastor Femi, I, I built this business with my hands. From the ground up, nobody gave me nothing. No handouts. Of course, I'm at the top. I deserve to be there. I went to school. I worked hard, I studied hard. My friends were partying. Pastor Chet, I was studying. Did I want to party? 
Pastor Tommy, I wanted to party. Me, I partied. But <laughs> I, I, I want, I, Pastor Femi, I wanted to party. But I was studying. I saved every penny. And I invested it in this business. My friends were driving flashy cars. I, I refused. I drove the same car for 15 years. I deserve to be here. Listen, my brother. You're not the only one that studied, though. But the vast majority of them are not where you are. And you're not the only person that saved every penny to invest in a business. So many people have saved every penny to invest in a business. They didn't buy flashy clothes. They didn't buy flashy cars. cars but today, they are homeless. The only reason why you are here is because God made a way for you. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you actually think it's the lies you told on your resume. You think you are sharp. Or you think you found a good person to conduct the interview for you. Do you know how many people get caught with fake resumes? Do you know how many interviews are cut short because the interviewer knows that this is not the person on the resume? Do you know how many people are kicked out of the embassy without so much as a conversation? Turn to your neighbor and say, thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. In, in, in Psalm 3, verse 3, David said, but you, O Lord, you are a shield around me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. The Bible says promotion does not come from the east, from the west, from the north or the south. But it is God that has lifted you up. You are where you are only because of God. And don't you ever forget that. And, and, and one of the most dangerous things about doing well is that you forget it is God. And you start to think it is something you did. It is so easy to forget God in the midst of prosperity. When we are struggling, nobody needs to remind us of God. When we have come to the end of our rope, Pastor Femi, you've tried everything. No way. And you remember God. You will pray, you will fast. But the minute everything works out, Man, I work hard. Man, it's not easy. I work hard. I can't lose this job. I work hard. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me show you something in Proverbs chapter 30 from verses 7 to 9. Oh God. I don't know if you guys know that the book of Proverbs was written by the wisest man in the world. It says, oh God, I beg you for two things, two favors. Let me have them before I die. First, help me never tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and insult God's holy name. In Deuteronomy, Moses told the Israelites, he said, do not forget the Lord your God. Because it is he that gives you, that gave you the power to get wealth. Do not forget where you are coming from. That it was God who brought you out of Egypt. Led you through the wilderness with scorpions. And snakes, but they didn't bite you. Hallelujah. The wilderness is littered with dead bodies. But yours is not amongst them. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one that helped you pass that interview. He is the one that opened that door for you. You know something interesting about Esther? Esther almost forgot how she became the queen. How do I know that? the way Mordecai was talking to her. When she heard that her cousin Mordecai was distressed, mourning, wailing in front of the, of the palace, that he had put on burlap, covered himself with ashes, crying hysterically in the streets 
What did Esther do? She sent him new clothes. She sent him what? New clothes. Like, guy, don't disgrace me here. You are wearing ball up in front of the palace. You are my cousin. What will they say? Please, can you change your clothes? I, I, I thought that was really very... I, I thought that was weird. When the servants delivered the clothes to Mordecai, he sent it back. He didn't say anything to her. He sent it back. So she sent a servant to go find out why he was mourning. Honestly, I am really surprised that she did not know what was happening. How can you be the queen and not know? Guys, come on, think about it. Women know everything. Even the ones that don't concern them, they know. They call it tea. I used to say intuition, whatever. Esther knew. And you know what Mordecai did? Mordecai sent the servant back. And good guy, told, tell them, tell her, this is what is happening. And this is the evidence of it. Take the decree back to her and tell her to go and beg the king on behalf of the Jews. Look at what Auntie Esther said. <laughs> Sorry, Queen Esther. Ah, I can't do. <laughs> Don't you know that the king will kill anybody who enters the presence uninvited? And he has not invited me for 30 days. So... <laughs> catch you on the flip side. She was simply making excuses. That guy had chosen her out of thousands of women. And women know, you know, when you want something from a man, Lord, you know, he does not stand a chance. You know where to get him. Dami, am I lying? Uh, if it is not your father you wrapped around your fingers, it's your husband. There's a man wrapped around your fingers. AK. Okay. You know. Can I be honest with you? Esther was, in that moment, was concerned about her life and concerned about her position. Position that God gave her. Life that God sustains for her. She had forgotten how she got where she got. And she was trying to protect her life and her status. But Mordecai reminded her. Mordecai reminded her. Because, you know, one thing I love about the Bible, you're dealing with humans. Yes. And sometimes we want to forget that they are human. So that we can separate ourselves from them. I am not Esther. Esther struggled with the idea that Mordecai presented to her. It was a risk. She could have been killed. It is true. Mordecai said to her, say, auntie, don't think that because you're in the palace you are going to escape. Her. If you keep quiet, <laughs> listen, God will deliver the Jews. He will raise up someone else to deliver them but you will not survive. He reminded her. He said, you were made queen. Perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Hallelujah. Even Mordecai himself was not sure. So he said, perhaps. He didn't say you were made a queen for such a time as this because you know, he wasn't sure whether she would rise up to the occasion. He said, perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Perhaps there is a reason for your blessing. My brothers and sisters, there's a reason for your blessing. Hallelujah. There's a reason for your blessing. Let, let me read you a quote from a guy called Martin Naimola. Naimola is a German, a Lutheran pastor in Germany when, when Hitler came to power. How many of us have heard of Hitler? A lot of young people here. You know that, um, look at what he said. Say, first, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Many of us in this church are immigrants. 
But because we are now U.S. citizens, we are unconcerned about the next election. America is about to elect a man who is openly hostile to immigrants. But because we're U.S. citizens, we think we're immune. That's exactly what many people thought when Hitler started. It doesn't concern me. I have my passport. Some of us are even going to vote for him. Listen, go and read, go and read up on Project 2025. Because you're sitting here, you buried your head in the sand. You think you are immune. Go and ask the Jews. Hitler didn't start with the Jews. But everybody kept quiet. Because it did not concern them, it did not touch them. Be careful. What you think will not touch you. Don't let it sweep you away. There is a reason for that platform God has given you. You have thousands of followers. Maybe you only have a few hundred on social media. What are you doing with them? There is a reason for all that money God has given you. There is a reason for the opportunities that God has given you. There is a reason for the talents, for the gifts, and for the position that God has given you. But for many of us, we have forgotten. We have forgotten the promises we made to God, the vows we made to God, that God, if you do this for me, if only you do this for me, I will, I will serve you. I will do this. I will do that. Mordecai reminded Esther, God has sent me to remind you. He has blessed you for a reason that's bigger than your comfort, that's bigger than your enjoyment. Now, I know some of us need to, uh, uh, we need to go and pray and say to God, why? Why have you blessed me like you have blessed me? Why have you opened the doors that you have opened for me? Why has my life not been as much of a struggle as the people around me? Why have things worked out for me and not for my contemporaries? Some of us already know why. But we're just, we're waiting for more blessings. Lord, when I hit a million, then I'll become, I'll start helping people. But right now, I am comfortable, but Lord, you know, it can go away tomorrow. Be careful. Some of us just need to open our eyes. Look around you. If there is a need that God has given you the resources to meet, a problem that God has given you the skill to solve, a pain that God has given you the ability to heal, do it. You can't go wrong, just do it. Be a blessing to somebody other than yourself. I, I, I'm sure as I'm talking here, somebody is saying, well, thank God Pastor Femi is not talking to me. I've been telling them since, they don't want to hear. Me, I haven't forgotten God. But let me tell you something. Not forgetting God is not just about saying thank you, Jesus. Sometimes gratitude is in how you empathize with people who are where you were. There's a concept of paying it forward. The blessings that you were given, at a minimum, you should be asking yourself, who can I help get to where I am? Who can I help to have joy? Who can I help? Jesus Christ said, in the last days, there are many people who will say, I knew you. And he will say to them, depart from me. I knew you not. Say, Lord, we, 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 where, where, if we had known it was you, we would have given you food. If we had known it was you, we would have given you clothes. If we had known it was you, we would have given you shelter. He said, in as much as you did not do to the least, you did not do for me. But every day we say, thank you, Jesus. Keep your thank you, Jesus, in your pocket and bring out your wallet and bless somebody. Bless somebody. Come on. How do you handle the things of God? Every day you are thanking him. How do you handle the people of God? 
if you are grateful to God who has blessed you, how can you watch as one of his children struggles with food? How can you turn your back? This God that you are grateful for all his blessings, his children struggle. And you are, you are thank you, Jesus, but his children that you can help. Isn't that a good way to show gratitude? If I have done something for you and my child comes to you and you send me a text, PF, thank you, and you don't help my child and you have the power, am I going to say, oh, you're grateful? Say, please, can you just shift dress? How can we have so much and give so little? Let God worry about the consequences. Let God deal with the problems that will arise from your generosity, from your kindness. Let him deal with the people who will take advantage of you. Let him deal with the people who will think you're stupid. Because in protecting yourself, eh, in protecting yourself, Jesus will pass in front of you like this and you'll be looking for him. Do not miss the day of your visitation. The Bible says that some people, they entertained angels, but they didn't know it. Not every need is a real need. Some needs are God's way of setting you up to bless you. You'll be shocked how many of us have missed angels because they looked destitute. Let God worry about the consequences. Let God worry if the person is going to use the money and smoke weed. Let God worry about it. He brought you here. And he will keep you here. If here is where you should be. Just trust him and do it. Esther eventually came to that point. Mordecai reminded her. And all of a sudden she stands up. And she says, fast with me. Pray with me. Let God give me favor with the king. That is the attitude we should have when we see a problem. If the problem is beyond us, let's go to God and say, God, help me deal with this. Don't turn your back and say, eh, you know, the king, eh, you know, if anybody comes, eh, okay, yeah, I'll be praying for you. No. If God shows the problem to you, and he has given you the ability and the resources. He's expecting you to do something. You were born for such a time as this. Turn to your neighbor and say, you were born for such a time as this. Your birth is not an accident. Your presence in the United States of America is not an accident. Your citizenship is not an accident. The fact that you have a job is not an accident. I'm going to close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap what? Generously. It is time for us to start to look outward. It is time for us to start to see the environment that we are in and the challenges that people are dealing with. Some of us are sad because we don't have money for a second house. Because we can't go to Greece on vacation. Some of us are sad because we've been driving the same car for two years. There are people that have no food to eat have no clothes on their backs. And we see them every day. We pretend like we don't know. We pretend like we don't see. Some of us even have family members who are calling us. What's up? <laughs> Once you see that plus one, two, three, just, just cover the phone. Just, just cover the phone. They, they've come again, they've come again. They've come again. How much am I going to give them? Would you rather be the one asking somebody for money? Eh. If you have the money, if you, have, if you don't have it, 
God must have other plans for them. But if you have it, if you have it and you cover your phone, because that same person asked you for money two months ago, as if you ask God for blessings once a year. No, seriously now. How many times, you, how many times in the last one week have you said, God, help me? Imagine if God said, eh, eh, mm. Am I the only one here? <laughs> Imagine if God said that to us. Every day you call me, every day you call me. Come on now. Ah, uh -uh, it's not fair. Imagine if God said that to you. Are you the only one on this planet? But we say these things comfortably. Without any shame. God blessed you for a time such as this. There are people who are starving. God blessed you to help them. That's why you are, they are paying you that kind of money that in your dreams you never thought you would see. Who are you helping? My brothers and sisters, who are we helping? Whose life is changing because of us? Whose life is better because of us? If there's nobody, if there's nobody, let me tell you, just remove that Christian thing you call yourself. Just, just forget it. Somebody should be blessed by you. Even the widow had only a mite. If it is only a mite you can give to the guy on the street, give it to him. You only have 25 cents in your car, give him the 25 cents. Don't just turn your back. We're celebrating Esther. If I perish, I perish. That money you are going to give, what will it cost you? Will you perish? Max, max, you have to defer buying the new car until next year. Max, your rent will be late. Or the check will bounce, $35. <laughs> let us pray. <laughs> no, for real, let us pray. Because <laughs> we're ridiculous. <laughs> let us pray. Let us talk to God this morning. We have become selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed, uncharitable, no empathy. That is not Christ. We have been called to conform to the image of Christ and no one else. No one else. We used to ask what would Jesus do? These days, we don't even care to know what Jesus would do. Please speak to the Lord. Say, Father, help me. Open my eyes to see why you have blessed me. And if you think you're not blessed, I can take you to a few places in Dallas that will remind you of how blessed you are. If you think you don't have enough, Chris and I will take you somewhere on Saturday morning and you will see people who don't have enough. Father, Show me why I am blessed like I am blessed. Show me why I have the things that I have. Show me who I can be a blessing to. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you because the message Mordecai sent to Esther was because you are a merciful God. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you will help us to hear, even as she heard. We ask that, Father, you will help us to rise to the occasion when we are called upon to do so. Father, Esther said, if I perish, I perish. Help us, almighty God, to realize that in your hands we could never be safer. Esther, not only, Father, did not perish, but she thrived. And the thing that she was most afraid of did not come to pass. Father, help us to rise to the occasion, to rise above our fear, to rise above our flesh. Help us to be salt and light to the praise and glory of your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we pray.